You're fine. All right. And I have a presentation, so mm -hmm. I don't know if I um uh, should share and being able to share my screen or yeah. So in a couple of minutes, once we're past introduction, you can share the screen and we'll go from there. Sound good? Yes, sounds good. Okay. So good morning. It is just at 10 and welcome to the live program here at the Sci Fair Library. I'm Rachel Eugenberg. I'm your hostess for life. This morning, I'm really excited because we have Dr. Nina Ellis Hervey with us to discuss black hair and its impact and its role in history. And Dr. Nina is a licensed psychologist and associate psychology professor, a certified life coach and a blogger. Her blog, Beautiful Brown Baby Doll, has over a million followers, which that's quite a stunning number. <laughs> She's also the creator of Now That's Life podcast and the Dr. Nina's mentorship membership program. And her research interests include findings of evidence-based treatment for children with autism spectrum disorder, psychological assessments, the significance of natural hair and personal presentation, locus of control and self-esteem, multicultural men and women, the use of social media and education and holistic health and wellness. You are also a hair and weight loss expert. And I'm very excited to have you in this morning to discuss black hair and its impact on history. So Dr. Nina, if you would, please. Yes, uh, hi, and thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you all. I appreciate you for um, even requesting my presence. I'm honored uh, to be here. Um, also, I want to first thank to Diana. Thank you so much for uh, for asking me and for having me. I'm so grateful, and thank you to the host as well, uh, Regina. You were so kind. Um, thank you for everything. So I wanted to first say that, and thank you to all the attendees as well. And I tend to be very conversational style in my presentation. So if you have any questions or anything comes up, I'm comfortable mm -hmm. with answering that. I'll try to get through the presentation portion pretty quickly and then allow for questions that you have and answer them to the best of my abilities. And I like to talk, so uh, <laughs> it'll be a great conversation. So I'm going to go ahead and it says to open system preferences to share my screen. Yeah, so if you go to share and then share content in that top menu, you should be able to share your slides from there. Okay. It's, I have a Mac, so of course it's making uh, me jump. Yes, yeah, sorry, here I go. No, I, I get that. My home computer's a Mac and the setup's totally different. Yes, hold on, uh, when I able to record. Okay, so it's saying I have to quit it in order to share, hold on. It, I've given it permission, but it's just saying that I would have to come in and come go back out. But I don't know if that's even it. And are you seeing a share button at the bottom? I do, but it's that's when it's having me open the ah. system. And it does let me allow it, but it says it would have to happen after I leave Cisco and come back in. So okay, I don't have well. to send it to you all and you can pop it up. Sure. Okay. That'll work just fine. And I can just lead you through the slides. That'll work. So that'll yes. probably be the quickest thing. My apologies. I didn't think of that. I've never so used okay. this. <laughs> I've never used this one. WebEx can be a bit um, of a learning curve when you're new to it. I know I've had that a bit too, because I know we're all very used to using Zoom right now. Yes. So I have Rachel, your email, I believe I have it correct. Yes. Let me see. And sorry about this, guys. I'm just going to pull up my email very quickly so that I can receive the PowerPoint from Dr. Nina. All right. I'm sending it right this moment.
Yes, hold on just a second. I'm also sending Rachel this link, so maybe that'll help too. A link that I just sent in your uh, messages that'll give you download rights. Yes, I'm gonna open that, um, Deanna. I was I had that infused in the presentation to answer towards the end too. Okay, so I'm going to answer. Was it that first question, Deanna? That's probably the best to answer right now. Okay. Um, so, what not to do, what to do, especially like in the workplace in terms of etiquette as it relates to hair. Okay. Um, that's pretty much infused in my presentation. Hopefully, as soon as we have that, because there's a little bit of history behind that. So I wanted to answer that question and uh, make sure that I infuse the idea of how we should uh, treat natural hair or African American hair or black hair because it's all different terminology, right? Um, black means the greater um, phenotype as opposed to the races within. And so I'll make sure that I infuse that and the importance of how to treat uh, people in terms of their hair and their differences all together. So we'll make sure that we answer that question throughout. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, Rachel, if you don't mind going to the next slide. Sure. Okay, so black hair, what is the big deal? Um, a lot of times people think of hair as you know, nothing more than just, you know, wearing a hairstyle or things of that sort. I believe as women though, um, regardless of race, a lot of times we know that hair can represent us in various different ways. Um, we often use the, the terms or the statement, our crown is our glory. Um, so hair has a deeper meaning, but more specifically, when we think of black hair, it started in Africa and it had so much meaning. And so it's no surprise that now it has so much meaning, so much to it. Um, and it's a part of each person's identity. And when it started in Africa, from here alone, people determined many things about the people that they came in contact with. So they would think of uh, what tribe the person came from. You could actually identify a person's tribe based on the hairstyles that they wore. And you could also determine their social status. That could be everything from war royal, soldier, or peasant, their religion, their class, and even their fertility. So everything right down to um, all of the, the basic needs in life, but also some of the greater things that we seem to believe are more private about us were known by the hair. And Africans had a hairstyle for almost any occasion. It didn't matter if it was marriage, if it was the death of death of a person, mourning a loss, all of that was included in hairstyles and choice. We can go to the next slide. So what else did it represent? Um, African women shaved their heads when they lost a loved one. So that was a common practice and something that was done um, to ensure that people understood that there was a loss, that something was um, something was not going on well. So it was a way to identify that something had happened that might have been traumatic, that might have been um, not necessarily negative, but uh, also something that was a loss. So that was how that was identified through the hair. And African kings even had these big fancy hairstyles that were braided um, when they went off to battle. So when they went off to battle or when they went off to war, they often wore their hair in intricate styles that meant or represented something, their tribe, uh, the people they were going to battle for, um, also their armies, things of that sort. So hair had way more meaning than just a common hairstyle and a commonplace hairstyle. And Africans were able to care for their natural hair and create products. And they made these products in their own communities. Um, and a lot of times we think of how many hair products now are meant to uh, serve the greater population, but more specifically 
Black uh, people as well as African Americans. So there's so many different products because that started so long ago. That's not something that's new. Um, in the past, people would use various different things of the earth, various different things from their environment, from their communities in order to um, have the best hair possible and even aid in the growth um, of their hair as well. We can go to the next slide. So early hair practices, where did the hair care come from? So I've kind of talked a little bit about that and how they found ingredients in their natural environments, but what else did it represent? And one of the first examples of native hair care products was something called Chebby powder. Um, it's used to boost hair growth. And the use works as seen on the Basuri woman of Chad, so of the Chad uh, tribes. And they all have this really gorgeous long hair. And so they had hair practices that really added to uh, the length and the health of their hair. So that started a very long time ago. And they used ingredients that included like lavender cotton, cherry kernels, mastic gum, uh, clove, and even perfumes in order to dress the hair and to moisturize the hair and to um, ensure that they could wear styles that we can go to the next slide. So this is an example of a woman of Chad. Um, this is her hair and this is how it grows. This is usually how they wear their hair there. But yet again, um, people of Africa could recognize this young woman of, is of Chad because they do have a special way in which they choose to wear their hair. So much more than hair, what is the real meaning? What else does it represent? Um, Africans believe that their hair helped them to communicate with their gods. So again, it was more than just hairstyles that they chose. It was more than a uniform look. It was more than a trend. It also had a spiritual and sacred meaning to it. Um, and Africans were proud of their natural hair. And it was not until the transatlantic slave trade between the 16th and the 20th centuries that there was a change in that. And as we all know, um, that was the time in which many Africans were enslaved, came to uh, America and began the journey of African Americans. Um, and a lot happened in terms of trauma and more specifically related to the hair after that time. So we can go to the next slide. So here's just a picture um, of a hairstyle that was often worn. And this is a, really an older portrait um, of those who were not only African, but those who came from Africa and moved into America. This was some of the common pr practices in terms of their hair as well. Very intricate styles. Like I said, they felt closer to God because of it. It was a sacred thing very proud of it, very proud of the way that it grew um, and took great pride in it. Next slide. So negative hair thoughts, when did that start? Um, and like I said, I'm gonna make sure I address uh, some of the questions. Where did it come from? Africans truly went through a culture shock when they moved, as anyone would, uh, coming from a place where you're celebrated, where you absolutely love yourself in and out. You love your hair, you love your body, you love your skin complexion. Um, but to move here and to have slave masters that mistreated slaves and referred to their hair as wool, um, it was made to dehumanize and divide. Um, it was a way to conquer and a way to make people feel less than. So that automatically started a lineage of people didn't have the same pride in they, their hair or have the chance to have the same pride as they once had when in Africa. So after so many years of seeing their hair as beautiful, they begin to see it as a burden because that was what was told to them, uh, that their hair was not uh, like those who had enslaved them. So it wasn't right. Um, and, and as we know, that is a tactic that's used to make others feel inferior. Um, so Western society made them uh, feel or supported them in a feeling of inferiority. So even more, slave trade sought uh, to divide and dehumanize, and they would place more value on lighter skinned Africans and or those with soft textured hair. And I 
have to make sure that I say and or because there's not a monolith. A lot of times we believe that it has to be um, one way or the other, uh, a lighter complexion with softer textured hair, but it could have been a browner context, a uh, browner um, complexion with a softer textured hair or both or um, either. If it was anything that made you different or closer to um, European-esque features, um, and that's when they found a way to divide based on those differences. Um, some felt that the darker you were, were and the kinkier your hair, the less attractive you were, or that was how the treatment was. Africans did not have access to their natural herbs like they did in their home communities. Um, so they didn't have the butters and the oils to care for their hair anymore. So they started to resort to bacon grease, butter, kerosene, and moisturizers uh, to use as moisturizers, shampoos, and conditioners. So that's a picture. And this picture has great meaning because um, what a lot of people don't know is styles such as these were actually used by slaves as a map on how to leave plantations, how to leave slave grounds. So it was a way for them to learn how to escape. They actually were very smart and sophisticated. So a lot of their hairstyles were road maps on how to get out and escape um, enslavement. So hair even meant something in that way. So a new way, where did it come from? Um, the slave trade was abolished in about 1865. We know things didn't end then, but that was about the year that it was expected to um, really iron out. However, it didn't stop racism. And in fact, racism probably uh, as a caste system um, picked up even more. And Africans were made to feel bad or inferior um, because of their skin color and hair, especially as they more of them started to move up north and integrate into various different um, walks of life. And it worked. And many Africans saw white hair as better than or more refined. Uh, because if you've heard all of this time that some, there's something about you that shouldn't be treasured, that is not uh, as beautiful as you might think, or it's not in comparison um, to another group the same, um, then you might feel more inferior. So they looked for hair care routines and products that would straighten their hair. So that started the whole straightening. Um, this is just another picture of some of the common styles that were worn um, and engaged in as well. Um, so a new way, where did it come from? African-Americans went a long way to straighten their hair. And some people were even dipping their heads into chemicals that burn their scalps, okay? Um, so we know that that leads to the greater idea of what we think of now as relaxers. Um, it's not the same thing. Back then it was more of a lie-based, um, completely lie-based um, chemicals and things to in order to straighten the textures of the hair permanently, the, to break the bonds of the hair. So the curly textured or kinky textured bonds. Um, this was where the rise of many entrepreneurs like Madam C.J. Walker came in who created hair care products. And she was first really known for her hair care products like the hair grower and the shampoo. Um, those were two of the products that were most popular for her, and it was natural and purely plant-based. A lot of people don't even know that. It was actu actually her first products were absolutely chemical-free and plant-based. Okay. So what about the Afro? Where did it come from? Um, the Afro was actually popularized by teenagers in the 1960s. Um, they were tired of oppressions and the brutality that was going on with African Americans. So they used their hair as a way to stand up and stand out against white conformity. Um, instead of wearing their hair in ways that their hair didn't grow, they wanted to make sure that they were seen in a light that was all their own, um, something that was special to them, something that made them stand out. And the Afro then became an identity, uh, began to an ident uh, became and identified for African Americans uh, during the civil rights movement of the 1970s. So in 1970s uh, is when you saw rise a lot of these of a lot of these uh, popular 
African-American civil rights figures. And so you had the political symbol of the Afro for Black activists, for people like Jesse Jackson and Angela Davis. You saw Maya Angelou. You saw many others who were standing up and wearing their Afros and wearing the textures of their hair as natural as possible. So that's just the picture there. So the growing hair love. Uh, where are we now with black hair? Um, and this is kind of a, this history can go very, very deep. I actually have a paper uh, that's published in the Journal of Black Studies about personal presentation in the history of natural hair. Um, but this gives you a general idea of the scope and the place and how in depth black hair really is. Um, where we are with black hair now is it's come a long way and many people are now really embracing their heritage. Um, it's no longer seen by a lot of people as something to be ashamed of, especially their hair, the way that it grows. It's to be celebrated and to be uh, loved. Um, and not only that, um, something that's celebrated in its various different textures, colors, tones, all of those various different things. And move, a lot of people are moving away from weaves and chemicals. And let me be very clear that African-Americans are not the only ones that use weave and chemicals. That's quite popular amongst all races. Um, but you're seeing in the African-American spaces and the Black spaces that more people are embracing um, just how their hair grows from their scalp. Um, so it's more of a political push uh, and incurred, has occurred in some places as well. I'm sure you all are familiar with the cases that were happening out in California and the legislation on making sure that children and adults who were in the workplaces and schools felt respected um, in the midst of their hair choices because a lot of the issues that were occurring, the discrimination, all of that were based on how one's hair grows from their scalp. Um, and not because it was anything that was heinous or untempt. It just was different from the status quo, which is another way um, to create a system that oppresses. So California has been one of the first to step out on that legislation and make sure that um, Blacks and African-Americans feel more supported um, in being themselves while in the commonplace. So that leads me to even my natural hair. Um, I like to briefly tell my story when it comes to natural hair. I didn't have a relaxer or chemicals placed into my hair until I was about 12 years old. And that was because I wanted it and I begged for it. I just wanted my hair to be straightened um, or easier. I've always had long, very thick hair. Um, not so much coarse. It's very soft, uh, very curly. However, I didn't want to deal with it. And being a child, and you see that people have this easier way of just placing their hair in a ponytail and being able to go, I wanted to do that too. Um, so one of the things for me during that process was begging my mother to do that. She was very reluctant, um, but my aunts convinced her. And then I got a relaxer at the age of 12. But by the age of 21, I cut all my hair off. Yet again, going back through that journey of what uh, I mentioned about Africans and their journey with hair, it was very symbolic for me to cut all of my hair off. And I wanted to cut off all the relaxed hair, start all over again, and grow my hair the way that it came from my scalp. And that was in 2006 that I cut all my hair off. Um, and it was quite the statement because at that time, natural hair movement wasn't really a big thing. Uh, people weren't used to seeing people who actually wanted to cut all their hair off, didn't want to necessarily have chemically processed hair. Um, but it was very much uh, intriguing for a lot of people, women and men. Um, and also, I had a lot of people that would ask me questions. Um, I started an online, um, at that time, an online uh, video, di well, not video, picture diary. And it was called Foki, F-O-T-K-I, which is where a lot of earlier naturals or women who, when we say natural, meaning going natural, 
no weaves, no uh, chemicals, no anything other than your own hair. Um, we would document the things we were doing with our hair, whether it was twisting our hair, wearing our hair out, wearing our hair curly or washing go as we call it, um, or engaging in different hair practices that you know we could celebrate. And so that started a movement in itself at that time. We can go to the next slide. And that just developed and formed into me celebrating uh, my hair and its different forms, its different looks, its different textures. Um, I've been able to, since that time, I've had, I've cut my hair several times since 2006, of course. Um, I've grown hair all the way down to my waistline. I've had hair for the most part, um, just to, or below my shoulders. That's where I usually like to keep it. Um, but my hair has done so many various different things that have continued to motivate others. And there's a world of women out there that document their hair practices, what they do, how they do, the different textures, the different styles. Um, if you get on YouTube and Google, or if you get on YouTube now, or even Google natural hair, you'll come up with so many things. And one thing that I really love about it is the digital storytelling. You have so many people telling their story and how they came to come back to an appreciation for their hair. It's not a way to put down any others who make different hair choices, not at all, um, because we all make our own hair choices. I always support that. Um, but so, for some reason, for some women, it was way more spiritual um, in their journey. It was, it was a big time thing. Like I know cutting my hair off also represented my weight loss journey. Um, I was starting to lose. I had lost over 100 pounds and I was keeping it off. And I figured if I was going to be changing the things that I put in my body in order to stay healthy, I couldn't continue to put things on my body that weren't keeping it as healthy for me. Um, and so that also led to me evaluating relationships in my life. When I cut my hair, I was cutting a lot of things out. Um, so it was more of a spiritual look to liken it to the stories of the Africans. Um, so I feel like it was a lot of um, a lot of mixture in that storytelling process and making sure that people understood that hair was so much more um, to African Americans. It means so much more, and that's why it's such a big deal, um, even on the workplace and in different places, because our hair, our crown, is truly our glory. Let me go to the next one. And so that led to even some of my publications and my work that I do as a clinical and school psychologist and professor. Um, a lot of it is um, teaching others even about this. Like one of the first papers that I did publish was in the Journal of Black Studies. Um, and I also have a paper on uh, in the psychology discourse that was more about um, some of the ways that we look at ourselves and the way that we view ourselves in terms of African Americans and um, how our hair plays a huge part in that and how we present um, and how we feel. There's so many nuances to hair as well that are hard to explain. Every African American person doesn't have the same hair texture. Um, that's a part of our lineage, right? Um, you'll see women with uh, smaller curls, um, medium curls, you'll have looser curls, you'll have big hair, um, you'll have hair that people like to keep uh, shorter. Um, it's just so different. And, and black hair is not a monolith. Everybody doesn't have the same kind of black hair. Um, you know, it's just a various different textures and all of those things. And I like to teach about that and ensure that my students, and even though I teach uh, psychological assessment and different other things, we infuse a lot of diversity and how a client may come into you or a patient may come into someone and the way that they present themselves may be a reflection of how they feel on the inside. So it can be that deep for black hair. Um, so that's something that I like to make sure that I go in depth about. And we can go to the next slide. Um, and that led to, as you mentioned, uh, Rachel, the journey to YouTube. And that was, it started off with me talking about my fitness journey that went into my hair journey and many other things um, that led people to be more empowered in their own walks, uh, more empowered in what they chose to do and how they chose to do it. Um, and I think also having um, what I don't consider the, <laughs> the gall to be me, but I feel like it is um, a statement to say, hey, 
this is me in my natural form and this is the way that I feel most beautiful and the world can take it or leave it. And that led to many other things. And I've always tried to, I don't know if you noticed in the pictures, uh, but I've always tried to make sure that my hair is something that's highlighted. Uh, no matter where I'm featured, no matter where I am, um, because I think it's important that other young girls and other older women feel um, supported in their image um, and seeing themselves out there so that we can take away some of those negative stereotypes and those negative feelings about our hair that happened during the tran transatlantic slave trade. Okay, moving back to the next one. Next slide. And that has happened across the board with these various different things. I just try to make sure that even on a personal level, I'm showing who I am to others so that they can feel represented throughout. And so on the next slide, one of the things that I like to teach or, or share is supernatural, which is a uh, which was an extension of the whole natural movement, but it was more than that because like I said, the hair only represented a small part of what was going on in the mind, in the body, in the growth, in taking back an identity um, and making sure that people um, <laughs> understood you, your lineage, those types of things. And so I teach uh, Supernatural, which is about strength, remaining unbreakable, being a powerhouse, um, staying encouraged and enthusiastic, staying renewed, having the nerve to be yourself, um, also showing aptitude or quickness of learning, being tenacious, uh, remaining unyielding, resisting the urge to change your mind, accepting there will be mistakes and loving yourself enough to change and be happy. So those are the biggest things uh, that I like to, cheat, to teach and that comes as a part of the natural movement overall, which is not just about hair, but it really did start with the acceptance and love of hair as of, of hair as well. And so the next slide. And so definitely want to make sure um, that's the end of my uh, presentation there, but I want to make sure that I answer um, any questions that you all had. And I did want to go back to the question that you sent me, Dion. So I'll make sure I think I pretty much added that in, but I want to bring that to a whole, is how do we find ways to make sure um, that we are discussing Black hair, especially among white colleagues, colleagues in various backgrounds, how do we make sure that we're discussing Black hair and etiquette, and what are we to do or not to do in those situations? And one thing I would say um, about hair is that because it has such a history, I think it's important that if you are someone um, that work with, works with or uh, communes with people who are different from yourself daily, um, it's just having a personal respect for them. Um, I've had to be very honest with people and, and say, you know, even at work, I used to wear my hair out all the time and my hair is quite big. Um, and I've had people say, well, can I touch it? Well, here's the thing. I'm not a pet. Um, <laughs> I'm not a pet. I might be cute um, and I might have a lot of hair, but it doesn't mean that it's meant to be touched. I mean, if you wouldn't walk into a store and ask to touch anybody else's hair, um, you want to be careful about that. Now, it, it depends. It depends on the context. It depends on the people, right? When I'm at work, I don't want to be made a quote unquote spectacle of. My hair grows the way that it grows. It's big, it's large, it gets attention, but that's just what it is. Um, so I, I don't expect that people will um want to make it into something where it's something to be petted or touched or uh, <laughs> all of those things. Um, so I think you have to be just very careful and mindful. If you're interested in a person's hair that you work with, maybe asking small questions about it. You know, it, you know, I don't know much about hair, but I really like your hair. It's beautiful. Um, my hair is this way and your hair is that way. Is you know, is there something special that you do or how do you do it? Ask questions as you would want to be asked. You probably wouldn't want somebody to come up to you and say, hey, can I touch it? You know, that might be offensive. You know, that might make you feel like, I, I don't know the, the word to put on it, but it might make you feel um, singled out. And also as if there's something to be 
um, made a, a huge deal of. Like I said, I've, it's kind of a fine line because it is a serious matter. Hair is big for African-Americans, but at the same time, there's a way to go about asking about it. Just as, just as much as you're inquisitive about other things and respect those things, um, I would say that African-American women and men in the workplace would want to feel the same way. And it's the same way in the schools. I hear a lot of stories of teachers and different people who have told children that their hair is not professional, um, that it's not good, that they need to have their hair done. And, and to that, I would have to say, what do you mean by that? If you're saying or, or implying that because that child's hair is not like your own, that doesn't mean it's not professional. That means that's the way that their hair grows. If their hair is clean, shampooed and conditioned, washed, um, taken care of, then it is professional. Um, and you have to watch what you say about that. Um, and I also have to feel like we have to take away this thought that just because um, hair, a hair that's connected to whiteness is uh, of white background, that it makes it professional. Because as we know, some people of all races wear hair that is unprofessional. So that is not just a black thing. Um, but if you're wearing your hair the way that you wear your hair and the way that your hair grows out of your head, it should not be deemed unprofessional if it is taken care of and it's kept. Um, you know, we can call it unprofessional if we're not washing it, taking care of it, making sure it's clean, making sure it's presentable. But it's very difficult to get into a land where um, we start to be offensive um, with our reference to a person who's different from us and their hair. Maybe ask questions about their hair practices. Maybe ask them if you're interested and see. Sometimes it comes off as a little bit more um, of a, a spectacle as opposed to just common knowledge and common information. And if there's quote unquote, and I think we take this word negatively, but if there's ignorance about something, then it's okay to ask. But just be uh, mindful of how you might feel in that situation, especially if you're the minority, okay? Um, and it's difficult to put yourself in those shoes, but it's okay to ask and it's okay to, um, you know, be, be careful in your asking and be um, cognizant of how one, one might feel in that situation. So hopefully that helped to answer the question. Are there specific resources such as books or film that you might recommend for further learning about black hair and black hair history, Dr. Nina? I do. Um, there is a book by Audrey Davis, Sivasathi, um, uh, The Science of Black Hair. It's a really great book. She's a chemist, an African-American chemist, and I actually know her personally. Um, and she talks about the hair bonds, how hair is uh, made up, the genetics behind uh, African-American hair in comparison to uh, the majority. Um, and she does a really great job of breaking it down and also talking about the story behind hair. Um, I, do, I went into it lightly here, just so you all can see that connection and that journey, but that book is really excellent and pivotal um, in that. Um, there are some, I'm trying to think of some good films that might give um, a good view of that. Um, there are some, I do like the Madam C.J. Walker movie. It's a bit more commercialized, but it does show even just the journey of an African-American woman and how her stance was on hair and why she got into that business, uh, more than just being a businesswoman, but also just the importance of hair overall. Um, and I also feel that there's so many journals out there uh, that celebrate Black hair. Like I said, the Journal of Black Studies is excellent um, for having a lot of papers that deal with um, natural hair, the composure of natural, natural hair, those types of things. So I would say those are my biggest uh, ones. But the book by Audrey Davis, Sifasati, even if you look her up as an author, she's had other books since. But those books are totally um, not just scientific, but also anecdotal and have a lot of information that really helps to understand it. And Jane has posted in the chat that we actually do have a copy of that in the system at HTPL Kingwood. So if you want to read it, we do have it. Wonderful. We might have to look into getting a copy for Cypher too. Yes, um, she's an awesome author. I've I've known I've met her I've actually been on a trip with her personally she's just 
really amazing and very knowledgeable. Okay, so do we have further questions for Dr. Nina? Uh, Sonia is clapping. Hi, Sonia. <laughs> I did not realize this software had a clapping application, but it does. Um, learned something new every day, learned many new things, so that's good. Are there particular resources that are your favorites for just everyday use? Um, so for me, I'm very, I, I guess I can talk about hair and just taking care of hair, period. Oh. Um, for me, I'm pretty simplistic. I don't like a whole lot of products. I don't like a whole lot of stuff in my hair. I mean, from shampoo, conditioner, uh, <laughs> shampoo, conditioner, gel and leave-in conditioner. That's pretty much my day. Um, so for me, I like, um, and I feel like these products can be used by anyone, but they're really good um, for curly textured or kinky textured hair. I love cream of nature products. So even if you have any kind of curl to your hair, excellent products. And you can find them anywhere from Walmart to Sally Beauty to the beauty supply, wherever you go. Um, so, and I think that's a misconception too, because often some of these products are placed in just the small black hair section. You all have all probably seen those sections, but the misconception is that, that pro those products don't work for everyone and they usually do. Um, so the Cream of Nature products, any of them, I really like their, um, I think they have a Moroccan oil line um, and I use their shampoo, their conditioner, um, and then their deep conditioner, which is an intensive repair conditioner. And I literally just after that, um, uh, leave in a little conditioner and put gel in my hair to define the curls a bit more. And usually it ends up in a bun like it is now by, you know, day three or four. Um, so I'm pretty simplistic and detangling for me. I detangle just like anyone, I think, in the shower. And I use a, um, a wide tooth comb or a brush. I like a brush called Brush With The Best Brush. Anybody, please look at that brush. I know the creator of the brush. Her name is Felicia Leatherwood. She's the stylist of Issa Rae. She's amazing. That brush does everything. If you have any problems with detangling, it's called the Brush With The Best Brush. That, have, that brush has changed the game for me. Um, so I keep it pretty simple and I also support others in keeping it pretty simple. A lot of, that's another uh, cool thing though about African-American uh, women and African-American hair care and my dog just came into the room. Uh, <laughs> and African-American hair care is that um, we tend to sometimes try a lot of different products, especially when we first go natural um, because we have to remember if our hair texture has not been as celebrated as most, we really don't know where to go. And you get to the point where now you have a lot of hairstylists that actually know how to do uh, African-American hair or even not just African-American hair, natural hair, uh, period. And you'll see that more often. And I think um, one of the things that I've learned is that in the beginning, you, you should try out all the products, have fun, have it being a, what I call a product junkie um, and see what's out there. Um, and those of you all who are not African-Americans, support your friends in their product junkie ways um, because they're going to want to try different things and see different things and see what works for them and what doesn't. Um, I'm going to pull the store up, you all. Um, she's fine. She's fine. Um, but we call it a product junkie and we usually try to see, <laughs> we usually try to see what's going to work best and you can be a support in that. And especially if you have lots of different products that you're using, normalize that feeling like it's hard to find products out here that work, um, so that that person may not feel as, you know, um, alienated with their hair. Because one thing is that our hair differs with texture, but basically something that you all should know is our hair grows the same. The thing about um, kinkier or curlier textured hairs is that uh, they're drier. So if you're not supporting it with moisture, it doesn't seem to grow as long. Um, and so if it's moisturized, it does. It grows at the same rate as a Caucasian person's hair, as a white person's hair. Um, everyone's hair grows about a half an inch a month. It doesn't matter who you are. Now, whether or not their hair is breaking off and not retaining length, 
is the difference. And that's where our products come in and that's why it's so important. Um, and not only that, another thing is our hair grows up. When you have curly hair, no matter the curl te texture or pattern, it grows up. So it doesn't seem to grow as down. Uh, right now, my hair is back down to my waist. You wouldn't know unless I pulled it down there. But when I pull it, people are like, oh, my God. And it's like, no, it's not a science project. It's just how my hair grows. Um, it's very, very um, curly and very coily. So when you pull it, of course, it shows its length. So that's the difference in our hair. And so products can help with that, help with restoring the moisture, um, those types of things. So to keep it plain and simple, I just try to go by the book with shampooing, conditioning at least weekly or twice weekly because I work out a lot. Um, because our hair is so dry, we don't need to shampoo and condition as much. We want to keep as much of the natural oils in it as possible to support it. Um, so I try to do that as well as use um, like I said, leave-in conditioner, um, also a moisturizer, and maybe a little bit of oil to seal that in. Um, but that's about it. Pretty simplistic and most naturals that I know and those ladies that you might Google or look up or the people that you work with in your workplace are probably, once they've gotten that system down, they're probably pretty simple as well. And if they go to a stylist, that stylist is probably very simple as well. All right, Kim Chandler is asking, do you have a book? Do I have a book? <laughs> I don't I'm have also interested in if you have a book. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a book, but I do have uh, journal articles that I've published and I have no problem sending that to you all if you send this out or use mm -hmm. it later. I can make sure that I point you in the direction of those and make sure that I send that to Deanna so that she has access to all of those. That would um, be awesome. But I do plan to... Um, write a book. I have been in the stages of that last year before everything happened uh, with Hay House Publishing. So <laughs> I'm going to revisit that and see. And of course, this parts of this will be infused because my hair has been quite important um, in my journey. Yes. Melanie asks, any YouTube channels, vloggers or bloggers that you recommend? I do, uh, of course, other than myself, right, you know, but I also love Natural 85. She's awesome. And she also has melanin hair care products. You've probably seen them in Ulta. Um, she has wonderful products. Um, another person that I really like, I love the Natural Chick. Um, her name is the Natural Chick. She's awesome. She's vegan, very much earthy and 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 plant based, and um, even runs with that with her hair as well. Um, those are two big ones I really love. I love Nappy Food TV. Um, she's awesome. She's Houston based as well, and we just happen to have a. Uh, brushed elbows several times before and stay in touch with one another. Um, I also love, I think it's LaToya TV. She's amazing. Um, and I'm trying to think of another that I really, really like. Um, if you're looking for a person to talk about Black satire and also Black issues, a lot of which in include Black hair, I am Eloho is another person who's awesome. She's a Nigerian American girl, and I really like her uh, content as well. And Ms. Prophet has asked for your weight loss journey site. Okay, so if you go to drninaellishervey.com, that gives you uh, my main website as well as um, I have a free eight day program there as well as a mentorship membership, but also it leads you to like my playlist that refer to my weight loss to hair care to all of that. So if you go to Dr. Nina Ellis .com, that's where you can find almost everything you need to know about me, all of my, my journeys, it'll lead you to YouTube playlists, I mean everything that you need. Um, and to briefly talk about that, um, the way that that fit into my hair, my hair journey, like I said, was I decided to cut my hair off um, I, during the last portion of my weight loss. Um, and I did lose that 100 pounds. It was probably about a 10 to 12 month time period um, that I lost it in and did it all without a trainer, without a nutritionist, 
did it all by researching and figuring out my own body, my own needs after failing at many diets uh, and not being able to stick to anything. Um, I had to create something that would be lifelong and it has been, this summer will make 16 years that I've kept the weight off. Good for you. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> there are many people applauding right now. I wholeheartedly agree with the sentiment. Do we have any further questions for Dr. Nina? Oh, and in the comments section, Regina has said that she shops in that section and she's going to try that brand and that she really appreciates it. No problem. Sounds All good. right. Okay, well, and thank if we have further questions. We will be sending out an email with some of the things that Dr. Nina has been gracious enough to speak with us about today. And this will also be posted on our YouTube. So in case you want to go back and watch it again, because you know, maybe you feel like you missed something and you want to catch up. Um, Diana, I'm sorry, I'm keeping track of the comments here. Diana says, thank you. You are amazing. Oh, um, says, thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Jones Clark says, I applaud you. And I'm grateful that our librarians honored us with your presentation. Jennifer Cook says, great presentation. Thank you for sharing. Shaheen says, thank you so much. Regina says, thank you. This was such a fast, fantastic and informative presentation. Thank you so much. And thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here with us today and being so knowledgeable in mm -hmm. talking about this subject Thank and you. giving your expertise because I know you have a broad variety of things <laughs> that you are an expert in, which is quite impressive. So oh. we may have to talk at a later date about <laughs> featuring <laughs> perhaps one of those as well because you got many many different facets of uh, of knowledge to give oh. and we appreciate that here at life it's real wonderful to have you here thank you so much rachel i appreciate that i really do um, yeah. like i said before i appreciate you all for reaching out and uh, diana oh. for reaching out and for yeah, i was gonna say thank diana she was the one who was awesome enough to bring you to to life and to do a lot of the arranging for having you and a couple of other folks that we've had on here as well. So, Diana, we appreciate you and your great ability to connect with people and bring them to a broader audience so that they get a shine. And speaking of life and continued programs next week we are going to be talking about since you have your dog out dr nina um it's a really good segue <laughs> next week we are actually going to be talking with tracy williams and angie of a golden excuse me golden beginnings golden retriever rescue oh. about fostering dogs because there is a holiday in February about loving your pets month. So what better way to give us some information about loving your pets than talking about the process of, well, who's fostered your pet first, you know? So we're gonna be on at 10 next week for that. Do join us and you all should get an email from me with the YouTube as well as a small list of the resources that you have mentioned, Dr. Nina, during this. Wonderful. You can send out whatever resources you want from there. Okay, I definitely will. All right, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us, and hopefully we will see you next week. Thank you. Thank and you happy Black History Month, everybody. Thanks, Nina. Thank you. Thanks for having thank me. You.